we're back. Hello, hello, everyone. So we've still got folks who are arriving, but for the sake of timeliness, I'm going to kick us off. Um, hello, hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Arielle Cates. I'm the Director of Programming at Village Preservation. So glad that you are here with us this evening with our co-hosts, the East Village Community Coalition, the 4th Street Photo Gallery, the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, and the Museum of Reclaimed Urban Space. Um, just a quick bit to start about Village Preservation. We have been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We host roughly 75 programs a year, all of which are now virtual and most of which are free and open to the public. Our events are meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural heritage, history and depth and the value of preservation in our communities. We're a nonprofit membership based organization. So your involvement and support mean the world to us. You can learn more at our website, villagepreservation.org. And of course we call our home the village, but it is also unceded traditional land of the Lenape and Muncie peoples. I want to acknowledge in this archival recording, the Lenape and Muncie communities, and especially their elders past and present and express gratitude for their stewardship of this land, for contributing to its geography and for the use of their language as place names. If you'd like to find out more about this, please reach out. I'm glad to offer resources. So just a bit of Zoom protocol. Please feel free to use the chat as you are already to say hi and tell us <laughs> where you're joining from um, or to raise any issues or thoughts during the talk. Um, but if you do have questions for our speakers specifically, please do use the Q&A function. It just helps me to keep track of all of your questions. Um, you can submit those at any point during the talk uh, and we'll get to as many of those as possible. So I am so glad to have kicked this evening off and also I'm very glad now to pass it along uh, to my wonderful colleague, Laura Sewell, who is the Vice President of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative and the Executive Director of the East Village Community Coalition. Laura, hello, thank you so much. Hello, thank you. I'm super excited about this program tonight. Um, as Ariel said, I'm the Executive Director of the East Village Community Coalition and we work to preserve the unique vibe of our neighborhood through our retail diversity, sustainability and preservation initiatives. I'm also vice president of LESPI, the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, which was instrumental in forming two historic districts in the East Village area, one of which is the 4th Street Photo Gallery is within one. And we're working on another and some individual landmarks as well. Um, our EVCC's website is evccnyc.org and lespi is lespi-nyc.org if you'd like to learn more. We and all of our sister or organizations, some of who are co-hosting this evening, work together in a really wonderful way within our own niches on behalf of our neighborhood. And no discussion of our neighborhood's rich history would be complete without highlighting the neighborhood treasure that is the 4th Street Photo Gallery. And that's just what we're here to do this evening. I think you're really in for a treat. Alex Harsley's own work is incredible and the work he's done to uplift other minority photographers and anyone who wants to walk in and talk to him, he'll help you out, <laughs> is really truly remarkable. So with the program is shared this evening with his daughter, Kendra Kruger, who is an interdisciplinary artist, scientist, and educator who grew up in the gallery. After earning her BA and MA in electrical engineering, she transitioned from the R&D industry into regenerative design and education. She founded a research platform known as FOR, the FOR is a theme here, FOR Love and Science, based on the idea that art can be a tool for science and science can be a tool for liberation. For the last four years, she's worked with her father on projects in which she helps create the narratives and allegories that exist within Harsley's work and vision. 
She works at CUNY's Advanced Science Research Center, running youth and community outreach programs. And she is a, a wonderful person. And I remember the first time I met her, she testified before I did at a, at a hearing. And I was just like, who is that? <laughs> so I, I turn it over to her to, to um, carry on the rest of the evening. And, and I hope you all enjoy this program. Thank you. Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, we're coming to you live from the 4th Street Photo Gallery here on East 4th Street between 2nd Avenue and the Bowery. Thanks so much for the introduction, Laura, and to all the organizations that are supporting this event tonight. Uh, so a little bit about the 4th Street Photo Gallery it was opened its doors in 1972 and was started through an organization called the Minority Photographers that was uh, created by a group with my father, Alex Hartley, who's been the managing director uh, since its inception in 1971, was when the nonprofit started. So this space has been open to hosting exhibits and different events, and we'll get more into some of the projects that came through minority photographers, but my dad as well is a photographer in his own right and has documented the history of the neighborhood of New York City at large and other places around the country and the world. So we're going to get more into the story of the gallery and him himself and his work. So I think we'll just jump right into it. So we've got a little slideshow for you and basically we'll be moving through the slideshow and Alex will tell you more about his life and experience and feel free to drop any comments or questions along the way and we'll just see where the story takes us. So thanks again for joining us and we'll jump away. And, and I'm going to, and since our Wi-Fi is a little limited here, I'm going to turn my video off and go right to the show. So Alex, Dad, tell us, when did you come to New York City? I arrived in New York City back in 1948. I was born in 1938 and started my voyage in terms of understanding what the urban reality is all about since I was brought up to be a farmer. I left early in that career at the age of 11 and arrived in New York City completely oblivious to what I was getting ready to get involved in, mainly changing my whole lifestyle and getting more urban oriented in terms of what I was going to have to do to earn a living in this environment here. So where were you living? Where did you first move to? Uh, that was the beginning of my introduction to New York City, mainly getting on the subway and then trying to figure out how I was going to get off since it was high up, in the, high up in the air. First time I was on the train, I was elevated up in the air. That was my first frightful experience of coming to New York and then realizing, well, there, there's a place up that you get off and go down the steps to get back down to the street. And you're staying up in, in, in the Bronx. The Bronx, Bronx. And on a place called Inter Intervale Avenue, 1146 Intervale Avenue, interesting number. And to make it such a good place to live is that I lived directly across from the playground and right from the playground was the school that I went to. And around the corner from the playground was a huge playground. And I had all the necessary facilities to grow up a very healthy child in terms of having the necessary information coming to me all the time to re-energize re me in terms of what I had to do and be. And then from the Bronx, you moved to where? Out of the Bronx, everybody's dream is to move into the projects. <laughs> <laughs> so all of a sudden I found myself in the projects. Went up and took a look at the room, rooms. We had rooms now, not one room, but rooms. So I headed back, back, and all of a sudden I got back to the back room and said, this is my room. After I looked out the window, I realized I had a beautiful view of looking downtown Manhattan, 
Looking across. This was my view. That was in Harlem? This, this is in Harlem. This is the sunset in Harlem. This is on a day such as today, right after a snowstorm. And all the snow is on top of the building with the sun setting in the background. So then when did you get into photography? Yeah, photography kind of, it was very haphazard. I, I didn't actually buy into this. Somebody sold me a camera. I didn't buy a camera. And once I bought the camera, I did the most awful thing that you can do with the camera is to take it apart, trying to figure out how it worked. Then I realized that this is going to be an interesting challenge. I couldn't put it back together, so I had to find a camera. And I went looking at cameras, went to camera books, et cetera, did a lot of research and decided on my first camera, professional camera with an exacta. After exacta came a Nikon. And then I realized I was really into it. Then I began to invest in lenses. So that was in 1959 that I really decided to buy into the whole photography thing. And what was the job that you got? Initially, most of the job, some of the jobs, was that of a messenger because I loved doing messenger work because it allowed me to be out drifting through the streets and getting paid at the same time. So somebody told me about a job that existed as a messenger for the district attorney's office and I should go down and apply. Again, I'm always following whatever lead that was put in front of me. So going down there, applied for the job, subsequently got investigated. Because I, after I applied for the job, got back home again, my mother said, what did you do? The police are looking for you. Apparently the district attorney sent <laughs> some big did that. So then I got the job. Then after a while of being with the job, I realized there was a photography department and I spent more and more time in the photography department during my free time. And got to know the person running there and find out that he wanted the job in the clerk's office and to be more visible and not out of the dark area that he was working in. So I kind of like helped him and he got the job working in the clerk's office and I got his job working in the photography department. This is all based on the table stuff. And the person I was working for who ran the whole institution named Frank S. Hogan, he was like the, he was like the next person below Hoover. So he basically kind of like, you know, winked, at, winked me and they gave, let me have the job as photographer for the district attorney's office. So were you taking so, pictures of things like crime scenes? <laughs> I, I, I photographed things after they happened, just to give an indication of what that reality is all about. Then I began to practice doing that kind of work. Then I realized that was like, a, it, was like it was beyond Fosnick photography and into a more or less a photojournalistic look at what, what I was seeing as I was moving through the spaces in New York City. So I was always interested in what other people doing to earn a living here in, in this town here. So most of the people that I seen in terms of the brothers, most of them was working on the street, driving cabs, and then having all the private business on the corners. Yeah, tell us more about this picture. <laughs> this is uh, all my way, way home on the bus. And I got used to taking pictures as I seen them before they actually happened. So you can see the bus railing right on the lower, east, uh, lower side there. And this was like a common scene for most of, uh, most of Harlem where people had their own little set up business running it from the corner, from the corner um, phone booth. So this was the perfect image that I finally found. And in the background, there's that standard ad for cigarettes and spotless cleaners. So that kind of like gave the space and time that this was taken as well as the car. So this is perfect because when I grew up here in, in New York City in, in the 40, late 50s, no, the early 50s, the Mercury was the prime car that most of the brothers wanted to get. They would get it and lower it and chop and channel it. So it was like really the car. So this is like a carry carryover to that 
<clears throat> environment that I kind of grew up in, in in Harlem. But here I'm on the way to home to the projects. Next image is, is, is of my sister walking across the street. And this was like, it was just an ordinary shot. I just wanted to get a shot of my sister walking across the street. And all of a sudden this became a very interesting conversational balance. So I began to play with balances in terms of my photography, especially when I'm shooting out the window. And to get the right kind of perspective, again, is practicing that whole photojournalistic story. To be, able, to be able to tell a total story, mainly by including the people in the right side, the cab driver, the cab on the left side, and, and the little Jeep in, in the middle, as well as the show while it's raining. So therefore you get the reflection from the street there. Then you get the little part of the shadow on, on the left side there. So I began to practice a lot of that kind of compositional work. Here it's like, you know, it's breaking all the rules and I tried not, but this was such an important picture, I broke the rules. And I've since tried to correct it, but there's no way to correct it in terms of perspective. This is this is one of two pictures that I took. The other picture is, is of another car down the lower, lower, le lower right, lower left, that kind of like gives it a certain amount of presence. The other, the other part of the picture, I cut most of the top off in order to not to show the people, when in reality, I should have showed the people as well as the car. So I always look back at these kind of mistakes that I made in terms of doing it the right way, not trying to get too artistic. I made a lot of mistakes trying to be artistic and left out a lot of important information. And you captured a lot of other cultural events that were happening in Harlem at the time too, right? Uh, there was always things, there was always things happening in Harlem. It's just a matter of where you was at the time that they were happening. Most of, happening, most of the things that happened happened around 125th Street between Fifth Avenue and Eighth Avenue. That was the prime show up place, especially Seventh Avenue and 125th Street, give or take two or three or four blocks. But I always, somehow or another, I avoided those kind of realities in terms of photograph. The reality here is I was working as a photojournalist to document the introduction of Minister Farrakhan in Harlem at the Armory back in 1972. So this was just a, a, a perspective I had on the women who basically were sitting together. Uh, as well, as a, I always try to find one person in the, uh, the whole group would always be looking at me. I was always interested in, okay, who's gonna be looking at me? Everybody else not paying attention. So somebody looking out for the group in terms of what that outside thing is looking in on them. So when did you move down to the Lower East Side and what was it about this neighborhood? The, the, the Lower East Side has been like a, a conquest from my point of view because it was like a, a you know, me no see, you no come kind of environment. It was very, very private on here in the Lower East Side, especially during the 50s. So I would come down to the, to, to the West Village there, hang out Washington Park. And then once I got enough nerve, I would walk to the East. So walking East means like I walk through this block here, going East until it got a little bit too stressful. And I cut and went down to the Lancy Street and walked out of the neighborhood. But this is always like a really tight neighborhood. So anytime you walk through a tight neighborhood in New York City, it was like walking through a war zone in a way because all of a sudden I became the enemy and the whole block would be, you know, you could, you could feel the energy of that people looking down on you. So I came down here back in 1984, but 1984 I moved to the, moved to the East Village. No, it was earlier than that, so 70. What did you say? <laughs> I'm losing track of time now. <laughs> uh, I moved to the village in 1964 as I began to think and realize what, what it was really all about. Because in 1960, <clears throat> I got drafted into the army and pulled away from the job of working at the PA's office. And I got shipped down to Alabama at a very hot time. 
I spent three minutes, three months on the post without even leaving, realizing I couldn't go off, off the post because it was going down pretty heavy the way I was down at Aniston. So then when I did leave to go to my post, I was afraid I'd get sent to the wrong place. I'd get stationed down there. But I guess the people who kind of like was looking in terms of how I was feeling about everything decided to send me to what you might call a, a safe place. And it's that safe place in Fort Devon, Massachusetts. That allowed me to come back into the city every weekend that I, that I had off. And at the same time, still be able to practice photography. So I did that for pretty close to three years and finally got out and realized I didn't want to go back into the institutions anymore and work for the institution. I wanted to stock out on my own and begin to get a little bit deep into photography, especially color. So I first got into photojournalism working for a little outfit on 125th Street called M Associates. That gave me a lot of society. Uh -oh. One of the main jobs that I had at that time was working at the World's Fair as a photographer. And I photographed uh, Baba Olatunji for the first time performing at the World's Fair. I didn't realize it was him until many, many years later. And, so, and then I realized, oh, I photographed him at the World's Fair, as well as a lot of other situations. Then I also got an assignment to photograph John Coltrane at the Apollo Theater. So then I began to look back in terms of the images I did of the Apollo Theater. So my image go back to the Apollo Theater when I came down from the Bronx to go to the Apollo Theater to see different people. One of the people that I went to photograph was uh, Ray Charles. You can take a picture if you want behind you, since, uh... <laughs> And the other person that I photographed was uh, Miles Davis as well as a slew of other, other people. And then I also photographed uh, Sarah Vaughn at, at playing at the, uh, playing at Birdland. So I was pretty well into documenting historical people at the time in terms of the past that I crossed with them. So it was like the beginning of me getting more and more involved in terms of what I was doing while at the same time trying to hold on to all the things that I've already done, then that was a job in itself. I, I look back now and say, I was I able to hold on to my photographic collection when other people simply failed to do that? Yeah, so tell us more about when, why, what was the idea behind creating minority photographers? Was that part of like trying uh, to create? That, that, that came out of a need to be seen essentially, and I went around with a project that I had done, and I realized there was no way it was going to be seen. Then I began to think about a lot of other photographers always is also in the same predicament. Once you've done something, what well, now what do you do with it? You, you know, you can't just go out and have a book made. And I found that photographers slowly but surely leaving the whole area of what you might call amateur photography and moving more deeper into what, what, the, what was then called, beginning to be called fine art photography. We are schools and universities begin to in, in, indoctrinate that whole art form into a curriculum so people get a license to actually go out and practice it as a master photographer. So that's where I came in at. Who are these people going to be? Uh, how are they going to control the whole idea of fine art photography? So I decided and had an opportunity to have my own little school to start the whole idea, okay, what kind of language is going to be incorporated in this whole thing dealing with fine art photography? So I began to open up the whole idea, like who is the artist? What is the artist all about? Who is the artist? The person who makes money or the person who basically just and there to practice as an art form. So that was the beginning of minority photography. So I had a number of workshops. One of the primary workshops that I did initially, once I got that on the road, was working with Ben Fernandez at New School to open up that whole conversation. And that was the onset basically of me getting more and more public to let people know this going, this is going to be what's happening in the Fourth Street photographs once I got the gallery open. 
to actually have a platform for many different artists to use to get their message out there in terms of what they're all about. Right. You started in, in your living room in Essex Street, right? Two pictures show. Yeah. And then it was when did I when did you open up on Fourth Street? Uh once I got the thing going in my apartment, it got to be every night almost. Every night. Eight days. Every day. So I had a a meeting rotating around an eight-day schedule so it would include everyone eventually and all the people who participated will eventually link up. Then it got to a point where I needed to have more space because more and more people showing up. So somebody say, well, there's a space on 4th Street that you could get, that you could get. So I came over here and they kind of like stuck me in the corner had me wait and I decided, well, I can't do that. I need to I need to get a space as soon as possible. So I went downtown and sat into the office for a couple of weeks. And the guy finally relented and told me about a space up here, gave me the paperwork. I came up here and presented it to the community and they kind of like looked at me begrudgingly. And the place that I that I that I was supposed to get, they said, We well, can't have that place. You can have the place across the street. So this was a place that they shunted me in and I came in here and the place was like four inches of dust on the ground, on the floor, coffee cups. It was, it was, it was, it was a space to me. And all it took was a little bit of care and attention to create the kind of space that I did create in, in here. With the help of all the other people who were attending, who was attending the workshops. So that was the onset of the Fourth Street Photo Gallery. The floor, my, my favorite floor. I spent pretty close to $500 worth of urethane to get the floor looking the way it looked. So people love sitting on my floor that I spent so much time. It was like a work of art to me. <laughs> and this was the setup once I really got going. I got more and more and more and more organized in terms of how the space was going to look. And so what was, what was, what was your like curation style like? Like what kind of artists? Would you people, like people would come to me with a portfolio. I had a, I had a, a Monday portfolio review session that became very popular. I would have three photographers for each evening come and I would do a portfolio review of them. Then out of that, I would figure out whether or not they were ready to actually stay in the exhibit in terms of how they felt about what they were doing, how to substantiate what they were doing, and how to defend what they were doing in terms of their own philosophy. And that's how I kind of got around to deciding on who's the best fit to actually use this valuable space to show their work. And what then I had major <coughs> slide presentation. I had a huge following for that. That was a regular event that took place here. I think it was every Thursday or Friday or something like that. So I had ongoing schedules, including uh, films, as well as workshops. And there was no other place that was doing this kind of presentation. So I found it very important for me to open up more and more to different people who basically wasn't really interested in having a show, but interested in being part of, uh, of, a, of a conversation group understanding and communicating what they were interested in with somebody else who had the same basic interest. There was also, uh, what you might call, um, a space for other artists to use. This is Michelle Bateta. Bistet she was into dancing, so she liked using my floor as a dance space to practice her dancing. So kind of, kind of projects you this project here came out of a, an idea I had of using another organization's uh, idea using the ge geodesic drone domes. And I figured I could collaborate with them to have a hang a show because it's very easy for them to set this up and very easy for me to suspend the pieces to actually be used to, to, to have the show. 
So I came up with this interesting idea, and then this this moved around to different parts of the city. This year, particular scene was like one that I always wanted to do was to have a show on, at 72nd Street, right off of Fifth Avenue. So this is the entrance to, 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 to Central Park. And I got permission to actually put up this show here from a project I was working with. This is one of the more interesting things I got involved in is taking some of the photographers into different places they would not even find themselves in their own lifetime. This was a, a trip to Hunter Mountain. And I took a, quite a few people up there and a quarter of them subsequently did move into that area. But this is one of the field trips. This is a long walk, the parking lot's way down over there somewhere. We walked, I think we walked an hour and a half all the way up to here to this little precipice overlook. And they were so happy to be here. To all of a sudden, you're walking through the woods, and all of a sudden, you walk to the edge of everything. And there's, there's like a 500-foot drop from here. <laughs> and there's this nice view of the mountains. This is on the way going up. I would have different stopovers that I would stop at, had city stop points when I took people on these excursions. So this is basically the stop to look at the throughway coming off of the Bear Mountain. And then you're also documenting a lot of stuff happening in the Lower East Side at that time. I gave myself the time and the space to keep track of what was going on in the neighborhood, especially some of the people that I got to know personally. So this is Bimbo. These, these, these people had, 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 had a will in them. And I like being associated with people with will and a fortitude to hold on to that will. And he was one of the people that I kind of like admired. <coughs> this is the community before renovation. These people at least 80 to 90 percent no longer live in the community. A half of them has passed, since passed away. But these are the people when I came into the neighborhood that was basically was the fabric that held all of this together. And this neighborhood was basically scheduled to be raised to the ground and left as an empty, empty lots. But a few people stuck up and decided that was not going to happen. So these, these were the people who supported that idea of maintaining the idea that this here is basically very important and should be saved. So that basically, this, be, this became the anchor for saving a lot of the part, a lot of the neighborhood that will have been destroyed eventually. And then, so this became a, quite a meeting ground for artists. What was the significance for, for Black artists specifically in this neighborhood and for the city? Black the, 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 the strange part about what you might call, I would say, artists of color is that we never really had a, a solid platform to do our thing that was secure without any kind of outside disturbances. So most of the people here were su suffering, suffering from the same circumstances. Suleiman Ellison, Vincent Smith, Hugh Bell, the Frenchman, and the brother who teaches at Queens College. So if, if, unless you've got a little, a little secure job, it was very haphazard to be a photographer, essentially. So this is the other part of the group. Four of the people in here no longer, is no longer around. The rest have simply moved off into different areas. Last night, I spoke with an artist, with a woman with the white hat, with the white hat on her head. She now lives in, in, in Cleveland. She subsequently could not deal with the circumstances down here and decided to leave. That's uh, Ms. Patton, Pat Patton. 
and that's Shirley in the background. This is the Shirley in the background. She subsequently passed away after being committed to a home. And beneath her is Veronica Sadler. She died alone in an apartment. She was found a couple of weeks later. She's a, a great pinhole photographer. And there'll be a show by her at Ken Calibra Gallery pretty soon. And the person next to her, he was, he was a fashion designer. And the person next to him, he was, a, he, he, was, he was the photographer of the day, Fred Floyd. He was so out there, people, he left an interesting indelible impression on most of the people. And the person next to him, he's a painter, Lamont, Ga Ga Lamont Gatewood. He's still very active painting. And most of the other people I can't really name or oh, Omar Kareem, he's the person on the left. He lives up in Mount Vernon. So these are people that basically, I, they, they just show up. I, I don't know how I communicate with everybody, but everybody showed up somehow or another day. Everybody was there. This was an opening, I think for Omar, I'm not quite sure. So I just used the networks of everybody else to actually bring in their network and then the other network and eventually all these networks begin to connect. This person here, he was a frequent visitor. He kind of like kept me uh, inspired. That's Robert Frank. So I kept him inspired and he kept me inspired. And that's his wife, June Lee. She basically kept him from sliding off the edge. These are two artists who came together all at the same time. The one on the left was from Italy. The one, the one in the middle there, she was from Germany. The one on the right there, she was from, from Japan. The one on the right, she, she was a feature in my video called the First Light Series. They, they were basically showing off their outfits. This artist here, he was the, the master street street artist, he, he would create all kind of pieces out of things that he found at night going through the garbage or going through whatever people threw out. There was a lot of people who basically moved out and the stuff gets put on the street. He would collect all that stuff and create these different art objects. And slowly but surely he came, became very famous. This is Vincent Smith. Vincent Smith decided that he wanted me to document his life story. So he gave me the commission to document his life story. So this was the beginning of that documentation. I met him through another, another artist. This is him in his studio who had to move out when they began to renovate downtown Brooklyn. He had a loft right around the corner from the, the major shopping area. This is Clyde. Clyde created three, three, two, Two pieces from a tree that died in, in Washington Square Park. He carved these African figures in, in the tree. Then a few la years later, those trees were subsequent that though his artwork was subsequently destroyed because somebody said that they were they were bugs in them and they had to destroy them, otherwise the bugs would kill all the other trees. So that's Clyde. There's a lot, of, a lot of different artists. Oh, yeah, tell us about Rod Rogers. Rod Rogers <clears throat> had a nice studio right off of, I think it was Sixth Avenue, somewhere in the teens. And uh, there were people who wanted him out of there. So they gave him a, a building and promised him to fix it up. And that's when he showed up. Down. I think that was in the 80s, somewhere. Somewhere around there. So when he showed up, I, I went over and said, look, I'm the photographer. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. <laughs> I said, yeah, 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 OK. So I began to document him at that point in time. So this is him with Dawood Bay. Dawood Bay showed up in the late 70s. And <laughs> he, he, he just insisted. So I kind of went and said, OK, what do you want? So then I became very close friends with Dawood Bay. And we kind of like was very close buddies all the way through him going through Yale, coming out of Yale. 
getting a job working as a tenured professional down in Rutgers University and subsequently moving to Chicago and raising a family. So my family, his family became very close. So that's Dawood Bay. He subsequently went around and got his, they got his ultimate dream, which was MacArthur. So he got his MacArthur and kind of like settled back a little bit more. So there's, there's many different artists that you've, um, that you've uh, documented. This is Amir of Baraka. I just recently put a, a piece on in uh, Facebook of a video I did of him when he gave a speech down at the Slave Memorial down on Holy, Holy Square. This is a photograph I took of him hanging out with Shirley. This was taken with a long telephoto lens. I think I used the 500 to capture them. And he, he just, you can see him just peeping back at me, seeing this object. I guess what not sure whether that was a gun or not. <laughs> anyway, so this is him with Shirley Campbell. They are very close friends. And he lived right around the corner, by the way. And uh, not only did you, you document so many of these artists, but also lots of people in the community too. Why, why was that such an important thing to get your neighbors and folks that just live on the block? I felt it was my job to photograph them because nobody else was basically, you know, that interested in photographing unknown people. So since they were my neighbors, I always found the opportunity once I found them with, with another of their friends or one of their, their, their relatives, I would rush out and take a picture of them. This is another person who I didn't I didn't really know him. I used to see him in the distance. He was working at La Mama. And then one evening he showed up with, he said, I want you to take my picture. And I looked, looked, and began to go look up at him and realized it was him. <laughs> and he had this piece that he had created. He said, I want you to photograph me with my art artworks. So that was my first informal introduction to him. Subsequently, I went on to find out just what he was really all about. I also posted that on my Facebook page with another person who knew him and gave a little bit of background on his, on his, uh, his, his history. So this is him. He came back one evening before he passed away. He wanted me to get a photograph of him as a baby with his father. So this is the last photograph I took of him before he passed away. This is, these, these are the groups. This is the MHA, when the MHA first got formed up. And the next image was a standard street party. So generally during the street parties, what happened during the street parties, all the old timers who used to be part of the community would show up for the street party. And I knowing, say, okay, they're all together. Let me quick go, let me go in. And everybody recognized me as, okay, that's Alex. Come on, let's go for it, y'all. So they all knew that I was basically the one to get the history of their history. And uh, and so now you're working on doing a lot of archiving of video, right? So you've got, tell us about your video collection of interviews. <clears throat> From the onset of starting minority photographers, in fact, all, all everything that I've done, I've always been based in archiving, putting it aside for, for future history. Because when I came to the city, I realized early on that it's very important to create a history. And the only way to create a history, each little bit and piece that I was going to be doing had to be carefully put aside to be led, later cataloged in terms of the time that it was done. So eventually the photography turned into books. What I mean by books, negative books, where all the information is, is, is put at. It's not in any specific order, but the order that I generally have in my head is by individual negatives. And those individual negatives I use in terms of different history events that took place. So I pull out more important images, put that aside, and that becomes the history for, as that time period. Then over a period of time, I got involved in video. So I got involved in video in 1992 because this person I was working with at the time doing still photography 
wanted me to do video and I have a video camera. So they said, well, you need to buy a video camera. So she helped me buy a video camera. At that point, it was the beginning of me doing documentation using video. So this is a, this, the, the video you're looking at now is a, one of the best black photographers that I came across at the time. Her name was Malu Matute. She was very aggressive, effeminate, and she had, was getting ready to prepare a show for the, for, the, for the gallery. And her prints was meticulously printed, beautiful 20 by 24s, very difficult to do. And she was really into it since she studied with some of the best. So I had to go up to her apartment and help her put the show together because she had contracted multiple sclerosis and slowly but surely debilitating her. This video here is of a commission I got from the Omber director to document his program, trying to pull all the poets together that was in place during the 50s and 60s in a special symposium that was held at NYU. His name was David Henderson. And the people he pulled in was the, the key poet of the, the time. So this is the video of, of, that, of that event, as well as he had other little private events in, in the libraries and also here in the gallery that I also documented. So that's a bit, a bit of history of Umbro that I have that I have here in terms of video also started a project called the First Light Series back in the early, late, late 90s, I'd say 2000, I began that video series called the First Light Series. That allowed me to kind of like explore some of the things that I had questions about because early on in 1967, 68, I began, I began to get taken interest in terms of what NASA was doing to document their trip to Mars in terms of technology that was going to be used. So I was wondering what kind of aggressive futuristic technology that, that was going to be used to do that. So that got me involved in, I would say, early photography dealing with the myth of, of the first light, mainly the, the beginning of time in terms of the Big Bang Theory. So it kind of like, it, it allowed me to go a little bit deep into that area of thinking since it was a thinking I was involved in initially without really having the necessary tools to illustrate my point of view in terms of the beginning of time. So I picked two individuals to illustrate dark energy and dark matter and have those two entities kind of like tell the whole story, utilizing the various spaces and time that they performed in. So that was mine. Then I worked pretty close to 30,000 DVDs over the period of something like uh, 20 some years. Because I found it very easy to do to sit at the, 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 the computer and spend four or five hours just editing, editing a se sequence, taking a couple of days and going back and looking at it and say, well, I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this. So with the first light series, I went into pretty close to, I would say, 18 years of editing that video. Even today, I still like going back and, do, and adding different pieces to it. So that's how I got involved in basically documenting and archiving my work, as well as the information that I got from shows that was here, conversation that was here. So I have all that information. I have to always try to keep abreast of the information that I have here, which is an ongoing job being an archivist as well as basically running a gallery. So I wear many different hats here from keeping the gallery clean, keeping the windows clean, all the other necessary things, making sure the gallery remains what it should look like. So the edits that I did was like you know, all this funny, funny stuff. I like playing with funny stuff in terms of my edits because now I had the tools to really get deeper into the funny stuff. So this is like about five years into editing the First Light series when I finally got around using all the tools that was avail available to me. So tell us a little bit more about what's coming up next. 
I, I early on in 1959, I got involved in exhibiting my work by a person named Ray Francis. Now, Ray Francis is synonymous with starting an organization called Comerengue Workshop that started and evolved out of Harlem, that grew, it's still in existence. In fact, I just said, said something, seen something that they were having a show somewhere down in Virginia. And they're still ex extremely active. It's run by, uh, I can't remember his name now. So it all came out of that kind of reality in terms of me trying to figure out what I was going to do in terms of creating that kind of space. And coming up, now for in the summer you've got a new show i'll be showing pretty soon at uh what's the name of that place pioneer works, pioneer works. my daughter lined that up <laughs> she got a freelance job working out there working with some kids and realizing it was very important exhibiting space so she, she decided that i needed to show there so she arranged uh, a meeting between me and the people running the place. They did an extensive review of what I was all about and decided, yes, we can do something with him. So then it was a matter of me, well, what am I going to do? Because <laughs> I just had a very important show over the Sheen Center that another person that I got to know also set up. Set up. So I'm, I'm more in that circuit in terms of people say, well, you need to do something with Alex. So over the years, I've created this immense collection of work that's ready to be shown. So it's just a matter of what I'm going to pull from, what I'm going to do, and how it's going to be, be staged. Yes. So I'm in the process of staging that show at, at the present time. And it'll be a, a collection of, of photo and also some of the first light video as well. So stay tuned for that coming up in May and June. Uh, and otherwise, uh, we're kind of coming to the end here. So just want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, and if you have any questions, let us know. Um, let me get back to the video. And uh, please stay connected. So definitely you can follow us on Instagram as a copy and on I'm going to drop some stuff into the chat. I have a slew of images that's also for sale. If you're yes, interested in purchasing any of the images you saw today, um, you can contact us both through the Instagram or our email. And I'm available for future interviews. And we have our website. What, thank you so thank you both so much. This is just so amazing. Um, is it okay if I ask you some questions from the Q and A? Sure. Yes. Great. Thanks. Um, okay. First question: Were you ever involved in the? Oh gosh, I'm gonna have trouble pronouncing this. I really yeah. apologize. Um, Hamoinga group of photographers who are on exhibit at the Whitney. Uh, and what? Yeah, um, that's the people I was just mentioning because uh -huh. most of them, some of them had shows here. So I had an open platform because I had the space to show work and they just had an organization where they met in. But everybody needed a, a gallery space. So I was always open to whoever came who was important and needed to have a show. So different photographers from that organization basically had shows here as well as had their meetings here to meet with each other. Huh. Yes, I had an indirect collaboration with that organization. That's I still great. have an ongoing collaboration with them. That's so great. Um, and Marco wants to know, could you speak more on collaborations or relations with other arts, political, and community groups from Charis to St. Mark's Church to Anthology, et cetera, um, or more generally how the 4th Street Photo Gallery may have interacted with social and political Well, every, 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 everyone needed some sort of services, mainly service that I had to offer, which are photographic or uh, video documentation services. 
So a lot of, did a lot of work with different organizations in, in that area and providing them with that kind of information, as well as logistics for actually getting the stuff published. So the number of organizations, you, you, you name, I'll probably work with them. Okay. We've had also a few questions about your archives. Do you store them at the gallery? Are you thinking at all of publishing them? How, how has it been to keep your own archives as you're doing all the other things? I have, I have a number of archives, many archives from some of the early exhibitors that show here. Some of the work that they showed here, they want to leave and put into the, the records of them having a show here. So have their images as well as a lot of back then it was important to if you're going to do something you had to have a slide slide reproduction of that work so I have a lot of slide reproduction of their work as well as the extensive collection from another photographer that i really got involved in terms of researching his name was gw meacham he was a photographer back during the late 20s and early 30s he was stationed in china so i have this extensive collection that i duplicated from his uh, originals of China. So I, I realized that was very important. I wasn't sure whether or not the person that I'm going to going to take hold of that collection won't be able to, to do that kind of work. So I did a lot of archiving for different photographers. One, another photographer I did a lot of archiving for with Eli Reed, who basically wasn't into working in the dark room. I had to print up a lot of his work and put that work on, on, on exhibitions. So I did that for quite a few photographers, as well as as well as helping them develop up a portfolio. So I would take a look at their work and explain to them what they should do in terms of making their work stronger. So I worked with thousands of artists over that period of time since I've been working here over the past fifty years in terms of helping them. And you know, all of a sudden I realized yesterday, once this was going to happen, the 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 whole of Instagram thing just lit up. I say, oh, I forgot about all of them people that have come through here. <laughs> so yes, you know, I, I I I keep moving forward and kind of like forgetting what I, what has actually happened over the period of time that it has happened. Yeah. Um, thank you. Okay, let's see. We have a question from Richard. Back in the sixties, did you spend any time at the annex? Did you know what Wesley Waits or Al Perry or Richie Valles or Goldberg? Can you just send me that guy's name? Yeah. These are some of the only people that I kind of brought into the minority photographer. Wesley Waits, for instance. He was one of the main people I used as a support mechanism to get all of this together. Somehow or another, through faith, he called me yesterday and wanted me to look at some of his latest photographs. So apparently he's still extremely active. So yes, you know, I, like I say, I forget where I've been and what I've, I've done. And <laughs> once people reminded me, say, oh yeah, 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 I did do that. <laughs> so, you know, being, being 80 some years old is like a feat <laughs> to remember all of the things. It's impossible. I have to be reminded most of the time. Yes, yes, that is very understandable. Um, so you name these, 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 these different institutions. One of my main institutions that I really plugged into was MoMA, as well as the uh, Museum of uh, Museum of History and the Museum, the Metropolitan Museum. Those are my main places that I, I was there practically every other week, wow. just, just going through and looking at them. Because at, the, at, the, uh, at MoMA, there was free days to get in. And other days, the guy would say, hey, come on in, go, go, go. go. <laughs> so he realized I couldn't afford $2. <laughs> so I, I supported a lot of institutions. Those, those, those institutions in turn supported me in terms of providing me with the necessary content and understanding what art is really all about. The gift. Um, okay, we have 
just a just a couple more questions. Um, uh, Rainer would love to hear more about your experience working with other formats like medium or large format. Uh, when I came into photography, I had to learn how to work with eight by ten cameras with a bulb shutter. A bulb shutter means you just, it's like it's got a, like a little bulb and squeeze it to set the shutter off. So that's where I came in and also learned how to develop film, eight by ten film especially. So I began to work with large format when I came in because that was a standard commercial camera at the time. So working at the DA's office, it was, it, was, it was very easy to learn that. Like I say, I came up to be a farmer and I learned everything, everything mechanical in terms of, you know, how it works. So the camera was no different than anything else. So it was very easy to learn the controls on the camera, to get the shutter, certain amount of time it takes to open the shutter up and then close it in order to get the proper exposure. So that's how I got into that format. And eventually, that format was beginning to wean itself out and 35 was coming in. That's when I went over into high quality 35 millimeter cameras from the Xacta into the Nikon into the Canons because they had the best lenses and the best kind of what I might call professional equipment that they could control. Everything is in the right place to take these wonderful pictures as well at the same time. I could stick it under my arm and go and take a this perfect picture and stick it back underneath my arm and keep on going. So that became my standard camera. Then I bought a, a Canon uh, rangefinder camera that was very slim and could be very easily hidden. So most people didn't realize I was a photographer until I pulled out the camera and took a picture and the camera disappeared again. <coughs> so most of the time I walk around the city completely, you know, like just, you know, like, and I was suspicious, I, I have to admit, I was in the wrong place. So one time I walked through the, uh, the camera store and walked through another store, came out. At that time, I was walking around with a 500 millimeter lens underneath my coat. And the police pulled me over <laughs> and they thought I had a gun underneath my coat. And the guy had the gun on me, so easy, easy, easy. <laughs> and I showed him the camera. I also had the, the, the range finder camera. So I pulled out the range finder camera and took a picture of him unlock, uncocking the gun. <laughs> so that was my close call with you know, being an undercover photographer. <laughs> so yes, you know, I, I went all the way to 16 millimeter cameras when I was working at the DA's office. Little small uh, mini cord. That was my favorite little mini cord. It was like, it would, I could take a picture with that with nice film and I could blow that up with quality to a 16, to a 16 by 20 uh, print. So that was the quality I was getting out of that kind of camera. But it eventually, yes, I, I stuck with the normal 35 and I worked all the way through that. And also down the road had to go to a larger format. So the format I went to was the six by seven Pentax. So that became the professional, professional camera. Then early on, a friend of mine gave me a, a four by five uh, Linhall. So that became the professional camera when I really had to do a job. I would take out that camera, set it up, and continue to take pictures, but really took pictures with the 35 millimeter camera. So that's how I got into all the different formats. But my main thing was lenses. I love lenses. So I had everything from 12 millimeter all the way up to 800s, and all the lenses in between. And most of them I traded away in order to survive here in the gallery. Hmm. Oh, well, it looks like you've got a few behind you at least still. I got into indirectly collecting. At a time, people were just giving these cameras away. They didn't know what to do with them. And now these cameras have become extremely popular. And people come in here, I, I want to buy that camera. So it's not for sale. It's for, <laughs> that's the other part of the camera. I want to talk about what is very important that I need to get on, on in the conversation, mainly that photography needs a museum. It needs a house. And there's no house in the world for photography. There's no photography museum any place in, in the world. There's photo mm. collections, but not a photograph museum. Because New York needs a photography museum. Since this is where it all started with Brady way back in the early 18, late 1800s when he did this thing. He opened up a photo studio downtown Broadway. Then there's Eastman Kodak. So, and then there's a whole fashion photo. This became the place for photography. 
It even had its own little district, the photo district. And mm -hmm. I find that there's no museum. There's nobody putting the conversation out there that there has to be a museum. So this is like a mini museum to show people what should be done in terms of pulling it all together, have all the cameras, all the stuff that we use for photography, all the books, everything's in one place. And it would be a major best place to come from all over the world. And it would more than earn its, earn its way once all of that's been done. Well, thank you for making space for that thing which should exist someplace else on a much larger scale. And if anyone here is interested in starting a museum, please get in touch with us. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> I had to get that in there. Yeah, it's so it's so important. I mean, we think about this all the time when we think what's going to happen to our archives. Where are they going to? And most people can follow me on terms of my little things I'm trying to put out there. And one of the latest things I'm trying to put out there is like there's some sculptures that was done by an artist called Gabriel Kareem that should go into Holland in terms of there. And there's another artist named uh, August August. She started an organization in uh, Harlem. Augusta Sanders, she did a piece for the 1937 World's Fair and afterwards it was destroyed. And I think that should be recreated, put in Harlem. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that I'm trying to get into place. And I do that on one-to-one. -on -one. So now I'm talking to everybody, say these are things that have to be done. And I generally keep this stuff in place on my Facebook page by reiterating over and over again. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of this. I'm just going to ask um, one last question. So Michael wanted to know if you've ever photographed the community gardens in the Lower East Side. And so my my question that maybe can include that is what in the neighborhood have been your favorite things to photograph? In the neighborhood, favorite thing to photograph is the, the wildlife and the fauna, <laughs> trees. <laughs> The evolution of trees, the evolution of rats, <laughs> and, and, and most of all, the the the, the evolution of the families hmm. over a period of fifty years. I've been photographing these different family groupings. So some is no longer around, but new new ones are coming into place. So I like keeping that all all that history together. Because somehow or another, my family is also included in that history there, mainly by having them stand with some of the people that I know in the neighborhood. So this is this is the community. You know, we all look bit different, but yet and all we live together. And so we have to realize we are a community essentially. And the only way that we're gonna survive with the necessary strength to maintain the next generation is to basically realize we are all got our family in this community. Well, I think that that is a beautiful, beautiful message to end this evening on. Um, Alex, Kendra, I know you can hear me. Thank you so much. So, so, so very much. And thank you for um, the opportunity. Yeah, thanks everyone so much for being here. Um, we are going to send out the, the recording of tonight's event so that you can share it probably tomorrow, um, along with a little survey, just hope to, hoping to get your feedback about our programs. Um, and, we'll, and we'll send lots and lots and lots of links. Um, everything that has been in the chat, we'll, we'll make sure to put in, in our follow-up email. So um, to Laura and all of our co-hosts, thank you so much for your partnership. <laughs> Yes, um, and um, keep keep safe, keep warm, keep making Thank art. You. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.